Hello, my friends of the Psychedelic Renaissance. It's Tom Hatzis, your Psychedelic Historian, and this is the Magic Herb <laughs> Mandrake. Before we get started, if you're into this kind of content, please subscribe to the Psychedelic Historian YouTube channel, and make sure you hit that little bell icon so that you're notified every time I post a new video. Also, it'd be great to link up on Instagram. Please find me at Psychedelic Historian. And we do have a private Facebook group, the Sanctum Psychedelia group, where we talk about all things wild and weird. We'd love to have you join that conversation. For now, let's get into the deep history of the magical mandrake. Like henbane, which I mentioned in a previous video, mandrake is one of those overlooked Solanaceae plants from the ancient and medieval worlds that people all across the Mediterranean used for its mind-manifesting capabilities. Unlike henbane, we aren't exactly sure where the name mandrake comes from. One possibility is from the Greek mandra agora, meaning usual meeting place, perhaps a reference to mandrake's growth cycle. You see, while the leaves and berries might wither and die from the plant, the roots stay intact, ensuring that you can always find it again the next year, in the usual meeting place. One Persian possibility is Mardumgia, meaning plant man, a reference to the somewhat human-like shape of the mandrake root. Another contender from Persia is the word Mardum, which simply means magic making. In medical Latin, it was known as Circium, or Circe's herb, as many people believed that mandrake was one of the main hexing ingredients used by that goddess. Some German texts refer to mandrake as Alaruna, which could possibly mean keeper of secrets, a breakdown of the Old High German Alla, meaning to beget, and Runa, meaning secrets. Whatever mandrake was called, it was recognized as one of the most widely used magical plants all across the Mediterranean in the great civilizations of Egypt, Greece, Rome, and Jerusalem. Like all plants of the Solanaceae family, the effects of mandrake are dose-dependent. Taking around a gram of mandrake will lead to mild visuals and a drowsy effect. One and a half to two grams will put you in somewhat of a more possessed state, where you'll probably see trails and have some mild visuals. In fact, when Hippocrates wrote medical recipes that included mandrake, he warned people not to take too much, lest they start tripping balls. And finally, upping the dose to about 3 grams or more, that's going to lead to a coma and most likely death. The possibility of overdose aside, does anyone here know why else mandrake was considered dangerous? Anyone? Anyone? Ah, yes, you, the young magician in the back. The mandrake's cry is fatal to anyone who hears it. Excellent. Ten points to Gryffindor. Mandrake was mostly used as a psychoactive aphrodisiac. And in fact, it was seen as so strong, so powerful, so magical, that people developed certain rituals in order to pull the mandrake from the ground safely. One of the earliest of these rituals comes from the Greek polymath Theophrastus, who wrote, it is said that one should draw three circles round mandrake with a sword and cut it with one's face towards the west. And at the cutting of the second piece, one should dance around the plant and say as many things as possible about the mysteries of love. Outside of aphrodisiacs and recreational magic, the psychoactive nature of mandrake also found employment as a religious sacrament. One of the best known examples of this comes from the Feast of Hathar, celebrated by the people of Dendara, an ancient town in Egypt. Legend has it that the sun god Ra sent Hathar to Earth to slaughter all of humanity. However, after seeing all of the human devastation, the sun god saw the light. Wanting to now save humanity, Ra ordered the brewing of mandrake-laced beers on an island called Elephantine, which is on the Nile River. This beer was then mixed with the blood of our fallen comrades. As it turned out, Hathar had quite the affinity for drinking people's blood. But the trick worked. Drinking the mandrake beer mellowed Hathor's harsh, and she stopped her slaughter of all of humanity. So every year, during the Feast of Hathor, which correlates to our September 17th, the people of Dendara and other parts of Egypt would drink this mandrake-laced beer in celebration of how it saved humanity. Others believed that this highly psychoactive plant was actually the forbidden fruit that Eve and Adam ate in the Garden of Eden. The second century Greek proto-scientific text called Physiologus makes just this claim. 
To marshal her case, the anonymous author of Physiologus brings up an odd behavior among elephants, an animal with seemingly no desire to fornicate. However, if they wanted to have a romantic evening, they should travel eastward, towards paradise, where there is a tree called Mandragora. The elephant and his wife represent Adam and Eve. For when they were pleasing to God before their provocation of the flesh, they knew nothing of copulation, nor had they knowledge of sin. When Eve ate of the tree of knowledge, which is what Mandragora means, and gave one of the fruits to Adam, they had to clear out of paradise. In short, Mandrake was one of the most highly sought after sex drugs of the ancient world. It's mentioned in Roman sources, like Sulla's Law, and in Hebraic sources, like the Book of Genesis. It also appears in Greek literature as a magical plant growing in the garden of that most famous witch, Medea. There's also an erotic comedy by the Greek playwright Alexis called Mandragora Zomini, meaning the mandrake drugged woman. Unfortunately, this play survives only in fragments. During medieval and early modern times, we see people using mandrake for both its mystical and numinous qualities. Both Orthodox Christians and not-so-Orthodox wise women, who would eventually be accused of witchcraft, used it for its psychoactive and soporific potential. On one side, we see Orthodox Christians using Mandrake to enter the Godhead. The 12th century Christian writer Thomas of Persane called this practice the good sleep of the eternal. The idea was to take a large enough dose of Mandrake, though of course not large enough to kill you, but to knock yourself into this experiential dream of Christ's love and forgiveness. Or, as Persane himself writes, for the Mandragoras symbolize aspiration through contemplation. This tranquility makes it possible for a person to fall asleep of such delightful sweetness that they will no longer feel anything of the cutting which their earthly enemies visit upon them, that they no longer pay attention to any worldly things. For the soul has now closed its eyes to all that is outside. It lies in the good sleep of the eternal. Additionally, as Christians slowly overtook the pagan traditions of yore, they changed the sex magic potential of Mandrake into one that was far more prude. Both Petrus Hispanus and Hildegard of Bingen say that Mandrake was a great way to quell sexual desires. Hispanus writes of an ointment made of mandrake, opium, and henbane that should be rubbed on the testicles to extinguish all thoughts of lust from a man's mind. Hildegard has a far more elaborate ritual. First, the mandrake should be washed. Then, it should be affixed to the abdomen for three days. After that, the mandrake root should be split in two and affixed to both thighs for an additional three days. Then, it should be ground up and drunk, and this would relieve the person of any carnal thoughts. However, as much as Hispanus and Hildegard try to change the sex magic traditions of mandrake, they were up against deeply rooted beliefs among the population. As such, they failed spectacularly. Even as late as the 1500s, which was centuries after Hispanus and Hildegard lived, people were still using Mandrake for its sex magic potential. We know this because the Renaissance magician Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa von Nettesheim wrote that after taking Mandrake, a person could fulfill Venus pleasure three score and ten times. And that wasn't the only pagan survival. As I mentioned a moment ago, wise women, who would eventually be accused of witchcraft, also used mandrake for what we would call its psychedelic or entheogenic properties. Wise women would often mix mandrake into ointments, along with things like opium, henbane, and belladonna, so that they could knock themselves into these deep but lucid trance states and walk in the trail of a goddess. Other times, they would use the same kinds of mandrake ointments to transvect or transport in spirit to mountaintops where they would encounter supernatural entities and heroes from legend, all of which was normally overseen by a goddess. Moreover, the 16th century text, the Book of Oberon, tells how people were using mandrake to see spirits. However, the Book of Oberon does not mention mandrake by name. So, how do I know that the author was talking about Mandrake? Simple. 
In order to see spirits, one had to employ what was called herba lucens, or the herb of light. And we know from folklore that the mandrake was the herb of light. Going all the way back to the first century of the Common Era, the historian Josephus writes that mandrake sends out a certain ray of light. Two later texts, the 11th century Old English Herbarium and the 12th century Harley Manuscript, state that mandrake shines at night like a lamp. I'd like to end this video by unpacking why I call mandrake a psychedelic or an entheogen. You see, when I call it that, sometimes people get a little testy about it, but here's why I refer to it as such. If people are using mandrake to see spirits, fly through the air, communicate with a goddess, that is psychedelia. That is entheogenic, albeit a more primitive form of psychedelia or entheogenism, but psychedelia and entheogenism nonetheless. Additionally, during the 1950s, scientists working with LSD said that it caused hallucinations and insanity. Well, when you read the ancient literature on Mandrake, they said the same thing, that it causes hallucinations and insanity. So what's the real difference here? What I think is that it all comes down to how and where you direct your mind during the experience. That is what makes a plant psychedelic or entheogenic. Well, my friends, that's all I have for you this time, and like always, I'd love to thank you for stopping by. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like and a share, and subscribe to my YouTube channel, where you'll find plenty more just like it. Also, I would hope to see you on Instagram and on Facebook, so get at me there. And until next time, I'm Tom Hatzis, your psychedelic historian, reminding you that you free your mind by using your brain. Peace.